second day of a brand new year. Uh, if you are new with us, we'd love to connect with you. There should be a card that looks like this in the chair in front of you. If you take it and fill it out, uh, we'd love to know how we can pray for you, how if you're interested in, in learning more about our church and uh, ways to get connected here, uh, or just have a conversation about what's going on here. We'd love to reach out to you this week and, and, and connect with you and your family. If you'll fill that in place in the offering plate when it comes by here in just a little bit. Um, a couple of things before we pray and get started. We're, uh, I want us to work this, this year, the coming year on, on, our commu- on communicating some things out to you guys. We've got a lot of exciting things coming up for 2023, and I want to make sure you don't miss any of those communications. And so um, if you if you um, are not getting our church emails, uh, I want you to take out that connect card and write your name and just your email. And how you know that, if you didn't get an email Friday about Brother Roger Duvall from the Redeemed House, then you're not getting emails. So I want to make sure that you're on our email list. If you did get that, don't worry, you're already on the list. Uh, we'll get that. We'll, we'll just add the new ones to you. So if you didn't get an email, did not get an email Friday, then take out that card, write your name and your email. Also, we have a phone tree system that we've used uh, every so often. Uh, we're going to utilize that more this year with just kind of some weekly announcements going out. Um, if you want to make sure you're on that, Put, take, again, take this out, put your name, the phone number that you want to receive those messages on. Um, and, and so put, take, take that out. Again, put in the offering plate when it comes by. And then also Facebook. Um, if you go on our Facebook page, if you have not liked our church page or followed our church page, please make sure you do that uh, in the coming week. Those are three um, outside of Sunday morning and our bulletin and so forth and our website. Those are three main ways that we'll be communicating uh, some upcoming things that we have for this year. And so I want to make sure we're all on the same page as we start out this fresh new year. Year, but we're glad that you're here to worship here on this, again, the second Sunday of a brand new year. Uh, I love New Year's. I love this time. It's always looking forward to seeing what God is going to do this coming year. And uh, so I'm glad that you're here in the house of the Lord this morning. Let me begin with a word of prayer and we'll get started today. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we can gather in your house to worship you, Lord. Thank you for a new year. Lord, a, a time where we can look forward and seeing, God, what, what it is with anticipation that you would have us to do this year, Lord. Lord, I, I thank you for the opportunity to be a part of a church, a church that loves you and loves their community, Lord. As we seek to be a church that's on mission for you, Lord. Father, I pray that you continue to open up avenues for us to serve, for us to show your love, for us to be the hands and feet, Lord, here where we live every single day, Lord, where we go to work, where we go to the grocery store, where no matter what it is, Lord, let us seek to be on mission for you, Father. Father, I pray for this time as we continue to worship you today, to lift our voices in praise, to open up your word, to study it together. Help us now, Lord, to put our, our sole focus upon you, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a couple of songs. Actually, we're going to sing three songs this morning. So if you need to take a break, just sit down, get a breather, and then stand back up and fire away again. But this uh, Sunday is all about worship, who Christ is, and why he's worthy of our praise. And that's what the songs are going to revolve around this morning. So sing with us. His name is wonderful.
darkness we were awake without hope without light till from heaven you came run there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the
Please, as we get ready to take up our offering, I want to uh, just um, thank you so much for over this last year for how you've been such a generous and giving church body and for the gifts that you've given uh, over the last the month of December as a church, as, as Southern Baptist, we take up an offering called the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. And, and uh, there's no real set time that we have to, to stop taking up that offering. And our goal this year was $5,000. And to date, we've collected $2,870. And we're about $2,130 short. And I want to challenge us as a church. Such an important offering. To me, there's, really, there's several important offerings that we take up that are really above and beyond. And that's Lottie Moon and, and uh, the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering. And so I want to challenge us as a church to really try to meet that goal and go above and beyond. And so I know you may not be prepared this week, but I, if you want to give this week, but I really want to over the next two weeks to seek to meet that goal and really give, because that, that offering goes to our international missionaries who are serving overseas day in and day out in places that are very difficult to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, so we want to support that offering. So I want to challenge you today as a church body to see what God may be laying on your heart to give over the next two weeks towards that. But thank you so much for being at such a giving church. Let me pray for our offering and then I will continue. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you're so good. Lord, you gave so much when you sent your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you show your love by giving. Lord, you gave. You're, you're, you're a God who gives, and you continue to give so much to us, Lord. And Father, at this time, as we prepare to take up our offering as a church body, I pray, God, that, God, that we are generous givers, Lord. Uh, Lord, as we seek to be uh, good stewards of the resources you've entrusted to us, Lord, and then given to the church, God, so we can steward those to, to spread your good name, Lord, to spread your kingdom, Father. Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and worship, God, to give back, Lord, what you've given us. Father, thank you for this church being such a giving church. Lord, I, I'm so thankful. I've only been here a short time, Lord, but I've seen, Lord, the giving heart of this church body. And it's such a blessing, Lord. Father, help us now to continue to worship through our giving. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 This is a new song we're going to do this morning for you. It's not my life to live. It's not my song to see. All I have is His for all eternity. It's 
It's not my righteousness. It's not my faithfulness. I have is His for all eternity. So much! What a great morning of worship this morning. Um, it's such, such a, a privilege to gather and just be led each week by a wonderful praise team that we have here. And so thank you so much, team, for leading us. Uh, it's good to be back with you all. Uh, thank you, Pastor George, for filling in last week. You know, I know you, uh, I watched you did such a fantastic, fantastic job, and I'm so thankful for you and uh, just thankful for your ministry and friendship, partnership, and your support and your prayers it means the world to me. And um, I, I pray that you guys have had a good start to your new year as we are about eight days in. Uh, I know that sometimes you make resolutions and for the new year, and sometimes eight days in, they're already gone. They're already done, and you're looking forward to the next year where you can try again. But I'd encourage you as you begin this, we begin this new year together to just stay focused, to stay focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to him and trust him uh, day in and day out. Uh, to me, there's really no other better resolution to make or is just a promise to look to him. You will fail, you will fall, you will falter, yes. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on him. That should be our goal for this new year together as a body. Our theme this year as a church is, is going to be on mission, uh, a church on mission. We're going to begin today with a study on worship, and we're going to be looking at worship and what is worship over the next several weeks. And then we're going to jump right into a study on the book of Acts. And I love the book of Acts because when you look at the book of Acts, it's a church on mission. It was the beginning of the church and the church, how the church started, how it began. And we saw that there was a church on mission everywhere they went. And so that is going to be our theme this year as we look forward to seeing how God is going to move in us and through us this next year. I'm excited. I'm excited to see what God is going to do. But this morning we begin with a message titled, Where It Begins. Um, and we're looking at worship. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to be in the first eight verses this morning. And I want to start by defining what the word worship means. 
understanding, getting this picture of the word worship. And over the next few weeks, we're going to unpack really some practical implications of worship. How do we worship in our generosity? How do we worship in community? How do we worship in our relationships? And so today is kind of the overall message beginning for this of what is worship. Where does it start and how do we set the, 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 the picture going forward. So when you look at the dictionary, if you were to pull up a dictionary and, un, and look up the word worship, this is most likely what you're going to see in the dictionary. And this is, worship is reverent honor and homage paid to God or a sacred personage or to any object regarded as sacred. That is, a, in essence, a secular dictionary definition of worship. But we want to know is where does the Bible define worship as? What do we see? We see it goes a little bit further than that dictionary definition. You see, the biblical definition of worship is to worship God, is to ascribe to Him the worth to which He is worthy. That's worship. You are ascribing to God the worth that He is worthy of. Uh, Worship is giving God the glory that He is due. That is the picture of worship. That is what we see throughout Scripture. That is what we see in our lives as people. Our job as followers of Christ is to worship Him. To worship Him. To give Him glory. To bring glory and honor to Him. And to do this requires us to worship more than just once a week. More than just on a Sunday morning. Our church, our God is too great to worship just one day a week for one hour. We're not fulfilling what worship is when that is all that our worship entails for us. And so what we want to do is we want to understand, how do we do that? What does that look like in our life? Because it's great to say, right? But how do we do that? And you may think, well, why is it so important? Why can't we just focus on worship on Sundays and let me be about my business the rest of the week? That's a great question. But I believe here's the answer. If your life has not been about the Lord throughout the week, then how in the world do you expect to come in here on a Sunday morning and flip a switch and say, okay, let's now worship? You can't. It's difficult. Why? Because the week is hard. Amen? Mondays, hard. Tuesdays, not much better. We're looking towards Friday, hump day, Wednesday. We can come, come to Bible study or youth or children and serve. We get a little pick me up and then Thursday and then praise God, it's Friday. But then Sunday's coming, right? We we look forward. It's it's more than just once. You can't just flip a switch. It is of extreme importance for us as believers to see that every day, every moment, every encounter is an opportunity to worship our God. Every moment. I love how Charles Spurgeon puts it. He said this, all places are places of worship to a Christian. Wherever he is, he ought to be in a worshiping frame of mind. All places. All places. Everywhere we go, every encounter we have. A quick side note before we jump in. To some, you may think, well, the concept of worship really sounds boring. Uh, well, well, we must understand something. Every gl- now, now catch this. Every glimpse, every glimpse, every picture in the Bible that's given of heaven and the created beings that are there is always a glimpse of what? Worship. Worship, rejoicing, praising. For example, if you go to Revelation 4, don't turn there, but you can mark it down. And you read through Revelation 4, you get a picture of the throne room of heaven. And guess what they're doing? Worshiping the King. Worshiping the Lord. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer. He says this, Any man or woman on this earth who is turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. In Isaiah 6, we see the calling of the prophet Isaiah. And it is known, it is a known fact that you cannot get where you're going unless you know where you began. In Isaiah 6, we see where where Isaiah begins, the calling upon his life. Isaiah 6 walks you through him answering the call of the Lord upon his life. And we have to begin to understand that our worship of the Lord, of the King, begins when you answer the call of the Lord on your life. When you say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ and you repent of your sins and ask for forgiveness, that begins your walk with the Lord. That begins a new life. The Bible says the old is passed away and the new is here, right? The old creation is gone. The new creation is here. You are here walking with him now. Now, the key to understanding the passage that we're looking at this morning in Isaiah chapter 6 is that God's grace leads you from woe is me, a woe is me mindset to a here I am kind of mindset. 
And that is what the worship of God will do. Because it takes your mindset off of ourself and puts it onto Him. Looking at Him. The call of God leaves a lasting impression upon you. And that is what we see in Isaiah 6. And that's what we see when we think about the concept of worship. And how we can see every, 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 every area, every moment of our life is a moment to worship Him. So look with me, if you will, Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to read the first eight verses this morning. God's Word says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne. And the hem of His robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings, and with two they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined." Because I'm a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me and his hand and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, who should I send? Whom will go for us? And I said, here I am. Send me. Father, as we seek to understand your word this morning, as we seek to understand worship and really truly where it begins, Father, help us to see that mentality of a here I am, send me. Help us to be a church that says here I am, send us. Here we are, God, send us. Lord, speak as only you can this morning. For it's in Jesus' name, amen. I want to give us three Points, three points of application or understanding this morning to see what it means to live our life in worship of the King, in worship of our Lord. The first one is this. We have to see God for who He is. You truly have to see God for who He is. I I love the picture we get in the first few verses of Isaiah chapter 6. He says, it says, seated high and lofty. Isaiah, uh, seated high and lofty on the throne. That His robe filled the temple. That the seraphim were above him. Get this picture for a moment of the Lord. Seated up high and lofty. His robe filled the temple. The seraphim worshiping him and proclaiming the words, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Let's break it down and understand what this means. Isaiah mentions first that this was the year that King Uzziah died. Now, why is that important? Well, King Uzziah was a beloved king. He had, who had reigned for 52 years. He was following God during his kingship right up until the end, right? And when he decided he did not need to follow the Lord's instruction anymore, not long after that, he perished. And so why is that important to know? It's a reminder. It's in fact a great reminder that the king they considered to be great died, but the true king God is where? Seated high and lofty on the throne. Seated high and lofty on his throne. It's a great reminder that no matter what occurs here, God is still on his throne. No matter what happens in your life, God is on his throne. The king that they looked to, they thought was great, passed away. But God was still there. God was ruling. He was seated high. Have you ever noticed this in a courtroom? And the judge's bench sits up higher. It's an elevated position. Why? To show authority. It's the authoritative place. We see in Isaiah's vision that that God is seated high and lofty in the throne room, meaning that he has ultimate authority. He is an authoritative God. He is a loving God. He is the everlasting king. And when he holds court from above, he is in control. He's in authority. He's reminding us of his power and authority over our lives as his people. What about the seraphim? They're described as fiery little angelic beings. Now, Isaiah sees two of them surrounding the Lord. Now, what are they doing? They're worshiping. They're worshiping their Father. Church, our primary task as believers, in fact, our delight as believers, should be to worship the Lord. To worship Him. Again, another statement by A.W. Tozer. He says, he says, I mean this when I say that I would rather worship God than to do anything else. Now, you may be thinking that sounds boring, or if you worship God, you do not literally do anything else. If that is your response, then you do not understand worship. 
Because the wonderful thing about worshiping God is that it prepares you and truly enables you to zero in on the important things that you are to do for God. And he says, understand this, every great deed done in the church of Christ, all the way back to the Apostle Paul, was done by people blazing with radiant worship of their God. Church, we want to be a church that is known for their worship of the Lord. That is, a blaze, that is blazing with radiant worship of our God. We talked about that on Wednesdays. We studied the book of 1 Thessalonians. I encourage you to come as we're walking through that book together on Wednesday nights uh, at 6.30 right here in our worship center. That's really our theme throughout this. Again, that's what we're talking about being a church that's on mission. Because we have a mission as the church. And it's to go and to worship God and his creation. And to go and make more worshipers, more disciples. If we were all to give ourselves to God's call to worship. Every single one of us, then one, you will be doing more than what you're doing now. And two, what you're doing now, what you're doing then will have even more significance and meaning. You know that there are so many people, I, I, I've talked with them, I know that you've probably talked with them before in your life, that are searching for more purpose in their life. They want to do something that means something, and they're searching in all these different places all around the world. You may be searching in your life today. I want to do something in my life that has meaning. There is nothing more meaningful than you can do with your life than to worship the Lord. To worship Him in every area of your life. Because when you're worshiping the Lord, guess what? You are in His will. And you are walking with Him step by step. Walking with Him throughout your life. Doing and living the life that He has called you to live. That's how you live your best life now. Worship the Lord. Look to Him. Trust Him in who He is. But again, if worship is only what happens here on a Sunday morning, then you will never understand the impact that worshiping God has on your life. When you, when you see God for who He is, then you will join in with the seraphim that Isaiah saw, and your life will reverberate what they said of, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the earth. But it's about seeing God for who God is. The creator, the sustainer, the giver, the, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. The one who speaks and things happen. The one who holds the whole world in his hand. When you see God for who he is, worship will take over every aspect of your life. And when it comes to Sunday morning, Sunday morning should be an overflow of your worship of God throughout that week. It, because you've, were, you've been in tune with the Lord. Yes, now I know some weeks there'll be down times where you're struggling and going through difficulties. But that's when you come to church and rely on your brothers and sisters to pick you back up and encourage you. And lift you up and push you forward and say, hey, listen, we, have, we serve God who is with you at all times. But you got to see God for who he is first. He's not some distant deity. He is with you every single day. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the debt of your sins because he loves you that much. So that you, could, you won't have to be separated from him, from him for eternity. Because he paved the way by sending Jesus. His love is a giving love. It's a love that's been put into action. The second thing I want you to see is this. Is there is nothing, absolutely nothing that we can do to justify ourselves before God. Before we can truly worship God, we have to try, stop saying that we can do it on our own. That we can justify ourselves on our own. And in verse 5, the first words that Isaiah himself speaks are a cry out to God. What does he say? He says, woe is me, for I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips. Isaiah is confessing. He's confessing that he is unclean. Now, unclean simply means not being permitted in the presence of the Lord. It's unclean, right? Meaning sin in his heart. Sin is, it is, is made him unclean. His worship was not pure. It was defiled. Unlike the seraphim whose worship was pure. Now, now listen, when, when you see how great God is, you realize how broken we are. And we see God for who He is. We realize how broken we are. And, and then it should lead to that conviction. That conviction to fall before Him and ask for forgiveness. Repenting of our sins. Begging Him to forgive. But praise God, you don't have to beg because when you ask for forgiveness, guess what? He says, you are clean. You are forgiven. At least that should be the response when we see the uncleanliness in our life. When we see the, the great vastness that lies between us and God when there's sin in us. But many times it's not. 
Because we think we can justify ourselves. But the seraphim who were above God were worshiping. Each, again, it says they had six wings and they used all four of those wings to cover themselves. Why? Why is that? It's because of the unapproachable glory of God. In verse 4, it says the pillars of the temple shook at the presence of the Lord. Can you just imagine the picture for a moment? Imagine the scene. And now Isaiah, the, the prophet of God, the man with the message, he falls flat on his face. And in essence, he's saying, I am lost. I'm ruined. I'm not worthy, God. I'm so not worthy. When Job who God himself called righteous, saw God. He said, I heard, I'd heard about you with my ears, but now I see you and I detest myself. Listen, because of the greatness of God, we realize our brokenness. And we realize that God is holy, meaning set apart. God brings prophets to their knees. And when the angels see him, they cover their faces. But in our culture today, we have brought God down to our level. God is not on our level. He is seated high and lofty on a throne. Jesus, yes, is intimate with us. And he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But you must remember that he is holy. And there must be justification before you can come into his presence and truly worship him. But praise God, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to provide that justification for our sins. To provide for us so that we can worship him with our lives. Now, now think about this. Isaiah says that he is, is unclean because of his lips. Now, I think this is interesting. Why does he say his lips? Well, think about his profession. He was a prophet. He was a prophet of God, and his lips were his pride and joy. How he, it's how he fulfilled God's calling upon his life. They are his greatest strength. It's the same way a singer feels about their voice. A quarterback feels about their arm or a scientist would feel about their mind. It's their greatest strength. When you realize that even your greatest strength in your life is not good enough or sufficient enough to bring you salvation or to transform you or to, or, or to justify you, you realize that you've been trying to use those strengths as a false sense of security or confidence that you don't really need God. And you, you use them to try and cover up your sins and justify yourself. And Isaiah says, Lord, I'm unclean. My lips are unclean. Lord, cleanse me. Woe is me. What do you think will justify yourself? Make you worthy before God? Is it your strength? Is it something that you're really good at? That may be the greatest source of sin in your life because it reveals the pride in your life. It reveals what is actually keeping you from worshiping God in every area of your life. And because that strength takes your eyes off of your hope in God's grace and makes you rely on your own strength, not His. So it's pulling you away from Him. Paul stated that whatever is not of faith is sin. Meaning that whatever good thing makes you forget that we can only be saved by God through Jesus Christ, by His grace, and whatever we do that doesn't arise out of dependence upon our Father in heaven and trust in His grace is sin. And our strengths, not our weakness, is usually where that will happen. So be careful. Be careful. Don't try to justify yourself. Isaiah says, Lord, my lips are unclean. I'm unclean, Father. The third thing is this, is that you must choose to answer when the Lord calls. Church, you must choose to answer when the Lord calls. We see Isaiah coming to a point in this message, in this passage in verse 5, where we see him say, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. But then in verse 6, we see that God sent one of the seraphim to touch Isaiah's lips with a coal from the fire at the altar. Now, the purpose of this is that fire was used to purify things. It was used to purify things that were considered unclean. So Isaiah knew that his lips were unclean, that he was unclean, and he needed to be cleansed before he could do the task that God had given them or was calling him to or just continue to serve him. Now, the significance comes from the fact that the burning coal was taken from the altar, taken from the altar where sacrifices were offered to atone for the sins. Now, we are getting a picture here, and I've told you this before, I love that the Bible paints us very clear pictures. I love in the teachings of Jesus where he gives us these pictures 
He helps us to see the picture surrounding the event that's happening. This is a picture of God cleansing His servant before He can accomplish what God has called Him to do. Now, listen, church, before you can truly worship God, again, you must see God for who He is. Understand that God cannot justify, you cannot justify yourself, that you must be justified through Him and the grace that's being offered. And you must answer when He calls upon your name. Realize that He wants to cleanse you. He wants to cleanse you so that you can fulfill the life that He created you to fill, to, to live. Right? This is not necessarily, again, referring to salvation. This is a picture of Jesus, the Lamb of God that shed His blood for us. Wanting to cleanse you so that if you're a believer and you may have an unclean heart, unclean hands in this moment because of unconfessed sin in your heart, know this, that He wants to cleanse you. But you may be someone who's not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, not asked for forgiveness. He wants to cleanse you. To make you pure. And only through Him and Him alone can that happen in your life. When Isaiah has this moment, it renewed the sense of God's grace in his life. In essence, it got real to him. You ever had that moment in your life where you're going through something, you're watching something, and all of a sudden it gets real? A moment where, you know, you've been praying because someone else is going through something, and all of a sudden that, that something happens to you, and all of a sudden it gets real. Lord, what, what is this happening? When that coal touched his lips, the grace of God went from intellectual knowledge to actual reality in his life. Instead of being just a head knowledge, he went to heart knowledge. And when he gave us heart knowledge, guess what? Everything changes. Everything changes. And for many of us, that's where we get stuck, is that we, we know everything there is. To, we, we, know, we think we know everything there is to know about Jesus because of our head knowledge. Right? You may come to church every week. You may go to Sunday school and never miss Wednesday night Bible study. You're in a small group or whatever it is. And you study, you read your Bible daily, you pray daily, you give, all these different things. But you know that in doing all that, Jesus could still be just head knowledge to you. You could be doing it because you're checking off a list, checking off a box, thinking that these are the things that make me a good Christian. No, those are the things that should overflow out of the heart of someone who's been changed by the Lord Jesus Christ. We should read our Bible because... Our heart's been changed and we want to grow to know Jesus more. We should pray because we want to talk to our Father in heaven and, and lift up our praises, our concerns, confessions, thanksgivings to Him. We do those things. We give. We love because it went from a head knowledge to a heart knowledge. And it's been, we've been changed. Isaiah was changed in that moment. Listen, church, until the grace of God on your life goes from being a thought in your mind to becoming reality in your life, you will never worship the way that you were intended to worship. Worship will always seem boring or monotonous or just something that you do on a Sunday morning because worship will just be a task and not an outflow of your life. Worship should be an outflow of our life. Because of the inflow of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in us, worship flows out of us. When Isaiah realized this, something happened. Something happened. In verse 8 it says, he says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who should I send? Who will go for us? He hears the voice of God saying, I need someone to go. I need someone willing to say yes. Now, can you imagine for a moment hearing the voice of God calling for someone willing to go? But let me tell you this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've heard that voice. You've heard that voice because that was the same voice that cried out to you when you realized your need for a Savior. And he called out to you. For some, he may be calling you today. Calling you to respond to him today. Or maybe some, you've accepted him. You've answered that call a long time ago. But some, somewhere in the mix, that got lost in your life. And you're not following Jesus the way he's calling, the way he's called you to, the way he's asked you to live. And so he's calling you today. The Bible says it's like a knock on the door. He's standing there knocking on your heart, waiting for you to open the door and answer, waiting for you to respond, or waiting for you to respond. Look how Isaiah responds. Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Now again, verse five, it was, woe is me. Now he's changed to send me. From woe is me to send me. I can picture Isaiah jumping up and down saying, God, pick me. Pick me. Lord, I want to go. It is impossible to have a genuine experience with God's grace and not become an evangelist for that grace. 
I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says this, you are either a missionary or an imposter. No in between. As a Christian, you are either a missionary on fire for the Lord, reaching people, going out, living your life on mission for him, or you're an imposter. That's convicting. Isaiah had confidence in the Lord. Look at, again, just step, take a step further. Look at verse 9. At verse 9, he says this, and what God had called him to do, he says, and he replied, go. Go. Say to these people, keep listening, but do not understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. God says, I need someone. Now, this is important. Because sometimes when you're, when you're following the Lord and doing the things he's called you to do, you may not get the response that you're hoping for. Meaning you may share your faith with people and they may shrug you off or tell you to go away or slam the door in your face or say, I don't want you in my life anymore. You may have had that experience before. God says, I need someone who's going to preach to people. To, he's saying this to Isaiah. For 30 years, that's what Isaiah did. But you have to understand those people, they will never listen to you. And you must go preach anyway. Isaiah says, I can do that. I'm willing. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but I'm willing. But why and how would Isaiah be able to respond to a call like that? Who would want to respond to a call like that? He understood that God was with him and it did not matter what the people did or what the people saw. All he mattered was that he was following Jesus. He was representing his Lord. He was answering the call because church, our job is not to bring conviction. That's the Holy Spirit's job through you. That's what he does. Your job is to be the messenger. And Isaiah saw that. That's why he was able to say, Lord, here I am, send me. Even if you're sending me to a people who may not listen. There are pastors all over this country, all over this world who preach week in and week out and people don't listen. There are some sure, Sunday school teachers who you feel like you pour in week after week to your lessons. And you feel like, are they even listening? In your life, you share the gospel. You try to be a good, believe, a good friend, a good follower of Christ and love people the way that Christ has loved you. You feel like you're not making any difference. Don't worry about man. Worry about God. Look to him and keep your eyes on him. Let him make the difference for you through you. But he can't make a difference through you if you're not willing to say, here I am, send me, no matter the task, no matter the place, no matter the difficulty, Lord, send me, I'll go. Send me, I'll go. Isaiah was with, okay with all that because he knew that God was with him, that God would supply every single need. And at the end of the journey, God would say to him, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the only glory that you should live for, right? Right? Not the applause of man, but the applause of the Savior who says, when you come into heaven, well done, my good and faithful servant. You served me well. That's the entrance I want to get when I come into heaven. It's not about a pat on the back here. It's about a well done there. Church, when you know that God is for you, that he stands in the gap for you, that he has your back, that he is with you every step of the way, it will drive you to answer the call confidently and to worship him wholeheartedly, even though there will be resistance there will be resistance. You've experienced it. I've experienced it. There, there are people, no matter what you think, if you're trying to follow the Lord, there will be people who come and attack you. But it's not because of them. It's because they let the evil one in their life come in and try to stop, stop what God is doing. You may be listening right now thinking, well, how can I worship God? How can I trust God? How can I obey him? You see everything happening in this world. You see the circumstances that may be in your life and they're, they're crushing you. We could say that you feel like the Israelites did when King Uzziah died. It shook them. It shook the people because they were relying upon him. Maybe today you're dealing with losing of a love. You lost a loved one. Maybe that person was the rock of your family. Or maybe you lost a spouse or significant other in your life. Maybe you're dealing with cancer. Maybe a marriage issue is just shaking you to your core. Maybe you've lost your job. You're having family problems, anxiety, depression, fear, is set in, addiction. Or you're just worried about the future. Are you going to be okay? Are your children or grandchildren going to be okay? Church, you need to see that where this world and those in it have failed you, God will never fail you. God will never fail you. He is with you in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your distress, in the midst of your pain. He is with you. And He is worthy to be worshipped. The calling on your life will sometimes have you walk through difficulties. Well, a lot of times have you walk through difficulties. But how you get through those difficulties is knowing that he will never fail. 
and that he is with you. And because of that, how do you respond in those times of distress, those times of struggle? You worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I want to be among the people who worship. Not because a pastor says so, but because we've realized who God truly is. That he is good. That he is a good, good father. And that we cannot justify ourselves on our own. But he, praise God, he brought that justification for us in sending his son, Jesus Christ. To save us, to, to, to cleanse us. And to know that he has called me. He has called me. He's called you. Church, we worship God because he called us out of darkness and into the light. The altar that the seraphim picked the coal up from was the same altar used to atone for the sins of the people. The altar that Jesus willingly laid down his life for us on. An understanding of that changes everything. You will see worship as an overflow in every area of your life. Even in the difficult seasons. In the year 1935, there was a man named uh, Jeffrey who moved from Indochina to a country called Borneo. And while he was there, he came across a group that were called the headhunters. Now, this group was known for going after and hunting people. People. They, were used, they used poison arrows to shoot through a blowgun. And once they had their target poisoned, they would take the head of that target, shrink it, and hang it up around the village. It was their trophy. Jeffrey knew that God called him to go to that village. A difficult calling. A calling that we may have wanted to jump on a ship like Jonah and flee to Tarshish. But Jeffrey went anyway. He went to the village and he began to pray before he even got there. And then as he walked through the village, and God did something miraculous. God began to work on the hearts of those people. The headhunters began to see the truth in Jesus. Jeffrey was never threatened. He was protected, not by the people, but by the Lord. People began to see the truth in Jesus through the words that he spoke and through the love that he showed. And they began to accept Jesus. Men all over that area began to accept Jesus. And in fact, they went on to build a chapel in the midst of this village that was once known for being headhunters. They made it out of bamboo and they threw their idols away. And with joy, they gathered up all the shrunken heads and they tossed them into the river that went out to the sea. Now in their language, they talk about Yeshua, meaning Jesus Christ, the Son of God, all because a man answered the call from the Lord. A man who saw that God was worthy to be worshipped. Knowing that even if, it, even if he went to this village and he became the next victim, God was still worthy. And he answered a call. God saved these people from head hunting, head hunting. But you see, in our lives as believers, it's not just what God saves you from, it's what He saves you to do. A people who once took joy in targeting other people and shrinking their heads as souvenirs now take joy in coming in their bamboo chapel and kneeling before the Lord God Almighty. And church, listen, that is what God has saved them to, to worship. That's what God has saved you to, to worship. He saved you from sin, from death, from hell, so that you can worship Him with your life while you're here on this earth and then worship Him for all of eternity in heaven. This life in worship prepares you for worship there in eternity. And until you realize that God has saved you to worship him, you're missing the point. You're missing the point that worship involves every aspect of your life. And it starts just like it did with Isaiah. You willing to come before the Lord and get down on your knees and seeing God for who he truly is and looking at him and saying, Lord, I'm unclean. Lord, help me, Father. I'm unclean. Cleanse me, Father. It's getting down on your knees before a holy God and saying, Lord, I'm confessing that I am not able to save myself knowing that you can only bring salvation to my life. And I want to worship you for the rest of my life because of who you are, because of what you've done, and because I can never get my fill on worshiping you, Lord. That's the call. And it starts by seeing him for who he is. Trusting him, knowing that he may bring you to your knees but turn your eyes to him anyway. Look to him and trust him. That there is no limit to what God can do through us if we yield ourselves to him. If we worship and show, worshiping and showing his glory and his, faith, his fullness and faithfulness. 
in our life, in this chaotic, crazy, sinful world, what are you doing with the spiritual life that God has given you? The spiritual light that God has put in you, the awareness that God has given to you. Are you choosing to worship him? Because in your life, you will worship something. It's either going to be something of the world or the one who created the world. What are you worshiping? What are you worshiping with your life? Worship today because he's made you alive. You were once dead, but through him, he made you alive. Know this, you were made in the image of God. Church, and because of that, you have the capacity to know him. And you even have the instinct that you should worship him. But the question remains is, will you worship the Lord? Not just on a Sunday morning, but on a Monday morning. On a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, and a Thursday, and a Friday, and a Saturday. And then back again on a Sunday. Will you worship the Lord? Because when we come here, this should be an overflow. Worship in the truest sense takes place only when our full attention is on God. And this morning you may be wanting to say, yes, I want to worship. I want to see my life as worship, but there's some distractions in your life. There are things that they're trying to distract you because the evil one does not want you to worship with your life. He does not want you to worship in every area of your life. So there's going to be distractions. There are things that he will throw at you. There are things that, that he will try to get you. There's bitterness, there's envy, there's strife. There's pain, there's sorrow, there's suffering, there's diagnoses, there's, there's marriage trouble, there's financial trouble, there's busyness, chaos in the world, trying to get your eyes off of Jesus so you won't worship him. This morning, maybe you need to come to the altar as we have our time of response and say, Lord, I, don't want, any, I want you to help me lay the distractions aside to see you for who you really are. To trust you, to worship you with my life. Help me to not be distracted by the poise of the evil one. Because we know the Bible says that he's prowling around like a lion. He's prowling around looking for ways to distract you in your life and your walk with him. This morning, maybe your prayer and your response is, Lord, help me to get rid of the distractions. Or maybe you're like Isaiah this morning. And you need to come and say, woe is me, Lord. I am a man or a woman of uncleanness, uncleanliness. There is unconfessed sin in my heart. And you need to confess it to him today. Give it to him today. Trust him with it. So you can go from woe is me to send me. Or maybe this morning you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Oh, I pray that today is the day where you answer that knock on your heart. And allow him to come in and transform your life. Repenting of your sins and asking him for forgiveness and trusting him. Giving everything over to him, knowing that there is no better life to live than a life given and sold out to Jesus Christ. What a better way. There's no better way to start out a brand new year than giving your life to Jesus. Trusting him, confessing your sins, confessing the sin in your life, and praying that God would help you get rid of the distractions and see through them so you can see him clearly and worship him in every area of your life. Father, as we come to a point of response in our time of worship now, Lord, Father, I pray for everyone in this room today and maybe in those even who are watching at home, Lord. Lord, that if there's something that is distracting us from our walk with you, Lord, distracting us from being able to see our life as worship, Lord, let it be today be the day where we lay it all on the altar, Lord. Where we come and we say no more. The evil one has a stronghold because of this in our life and we say no more. Father, there also may be some here who have unconfessed sin in their heart, Lord. I, I know there is, Lord. I, I know that we all struggle with that in our life. And Father, I pray that today, that, that, that sin that's in our heart, Lord, that we would confess it to you so it no longer controls us, Lord. Because that too can be a, a distraction from worshiping you, Lord. And Father, I pray, Lord, that this altar will be full of people who are confessing sin, praying for, to rid, the, rid their life of the distractions that are keeping them from worshiping you, Lord. And Father, oh, if there is someone here who does not know you as Lord and Savior, who has never given their life to you, asked you for forgiveness and repented of their sins, Lord, and surrendered their life to you, Lord, that they would answer that call today. Lord, help us today to respond with the words, here I am, send me. Father, speak as we sing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Church, would you stand and respond as you feel the Lord leads? The altar's open. Come and pray if you will. of our hearts today, Lord. Lord, we long to worship you today, Lord. You are our strength, our provider, our sense of peace. Lord, when the storms are raging, Father, we look to you. We look to you with our lives, Lord. Let that be the prayer of our hearts. God, that we long to worship you. Father, thank you for worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn over to one of our elders, Pat, Brother Ricky. You can come and close us out in prayer. Yeah, give him a mic. Thank you. Hey, now, just because we and Becky went to the altar and prayed together, we're not having any problems, okay? <laughs> Going to knock that one right on out. But, um, but we do have a lot to be thankful for, and we have a lot to pray for in our life. And, um, yeah, if we grow older. Your mothers get sick, you know, your fathers leave. A lot of things happen. One person doesn't leave us is Jesus Christ, okay? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna preach long. Where you at, George? He's not running out on me, okay? Um I feel like I would miss an opportunity if I didn't say something really quickly about the football player this week, DeMar Hamlin, that died on the field. And came back to life, you know. Ten million people watching. Football players, grown men, on their knees crying and praying to God to bring this young man back. Twenty-four years old. What did God do? God brought him back. You know. Heard a sermon this week, and it can't help but remind me of Acts. Is it chapter five, George? What had to what had to Pentecost, man? You didn't listen to the sermon I sent you. Four, okay. But two, two. Excuse me. I know it was there somewhere in Acts. But 
They had a great revival. You know, so many people came back to God. Could this be the start of a great revival for the United States? Could it be for the nation? You know, God's going to give us choices. What are we going to do with them? You know, to follow God, you got to give up some things. You know? Some of those things are hard to give up. We're never perfect every day. But I'm going to tell you this. Um, I've had God take from me and I've had him give to me. Okay? But I know that everything that I'm waiting for is in heaven. I want you all to know that same thing. I want you to know that whatever you give up here, you haven't lost it. Okay? So think about DeMar Hamlin. And if you hadn't heard his story, follow it and read it. And look at it a little bit when you're on those phones. I know everybody has them. I know everybody looks at them. They know how to get on the internet. Look at it and see how amazing that story is. There's a whole lot more to it than just what happened the other night. Okay, with that, um, I do want to raise a couple of people up. We're going to pray for them here today. Um, Ms. Wanda Sexton and Phil. Wanda starts her chemo tomorrow. Okay, but we know through the power of God, Amen. you're going to be healed one way or another. Okay, don't know which way, but know this you're going to be okay. Phil, you're going to be okay. You got us, but you got him. Okay, Amen. we got Sherry Campbell that you know works in our office and she's been attacked. You know, hey, we're going to be attacked as believers. But which way we turn is going to, what, going to be what matters. Uh, God, great crowd today, some new people. Um, hey, I love all of you. Even if I don't know you, I love you. And I know that our pastor does, and I know that we have people in this church that love you. And um, what are we going to do? Are you going to answer the call? I've answered it. I'm answering it. And I have to recommit myself every day. To, to live a life for Christ, but I try. I fail most days, well, every day, really crump, you know, I mess up. But God's already forgiven me, okay? Love y'all. Let's remember Wanda and Phil, please, in our prayers, and um, look up DeMar Hamlin this week. Did I say that right, Rebecca? Okay, DeMar, not Lamar, DeMar, okay? Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, and we come before you. God, we ask your blessings, Lord. We ask your healing powers on Wanda. God, we ask that you would just touch her and make this journey, Lord. Um, not so rough, Lord, but, but God, we know she's going to come out on the other side a better person. Uh, Lord, she's going to know more about you than she knows right now. And God, that Phil will, and many of us will, as we take this journey and we take this ride along with Wanda. And for those who hadn't had it, we can't say we know what it's like, okay? But I can tell you this, I know that God will be with her every step of the way. I know he'll be with Sherry. And Lord, I pray, God, that we would just see a great miracle here in this church. And Lord, that the people sitting here, that many would decide that it's time to give up some of those other things and live a life for Christ and come to you. And Lord, let them see how wonderful it is to have that feeling. When you lay down at night, Lord, when you close your eyes, Lord, I have no fear. I know what's going to happen to me if I, if I wake up here, I'm going to be with family, and if I wake up there, I'm going to be with family. And God, I just thank you and praise you for that. God, again, Lord, traveling grace to, to Wanda and Phil as they begin this journey. Let us not forget them, Lord. Uh, Lord, let's, let us remember them every day. And, and God, I just pray for her quick recovery and healing. And anybody in here, Lord, that's hurting and sick, Lord. I pray, God, that you would touch them and heal them. In your holy name, amen.